Good evening and welcome to Conversations with Crystal. I'm your hostess Crystal. Thank you very much for joining me this evening. And this evening I'm joined by Frank Sultana. Now Frank is an international blues challenge winner for 2023. He's an awesome songwriter, a really, really humble and lovely fellow. And I can't wait for you to meet him. Welcome, Frank. How are you today? G'day, Crystal. I'm good. I'm good. Thanks for having me along. Oh, you're very, very welcome. The pleasure is all mine. Um, I'm really excited to have you uh, talking with me this evening. I saw you last. It would have been at Goulburn Blues Festival, I do believe, yeah. and you're in a hall down there. And I thought, oh, wow, he's so good and so original and authentic. And the way you play blues is just uh, more than what you expect. Well, thank you. That's really nice to say. Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Now, tell everybody, you, you know, International Blues uh, Challenge winner, can you tell everybody about that? Because that's quite an achievement. Certainly. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, look, it all sort of came together the sort of middle to the back end of last year. And I, I went to the Sydney Blue Society Challenge and I won that in the solo duo section. And that sort of got me the, um, the, the, the pass through to go to Memphis in January. And so I went to Memphis uh, in January and competed against about 150, 160 other acts around the world and um, over about four days uh, with sort of nightly heats from Wednesday through to the Saturday. And I was lucky enough to sort of, you know, progress through, uh, made it to the final on the Saturday at the Orpheum Theatre in Memphis and, and was, yeah, lucky enough to sort of take it out, which is a real surprise, I guess, um, but a really um, pleasant one. Yeah, look, Frank, congratulations on that. That is, as I said, it's a huge achievement. Thank you. And um, just being able to win it here in Sydney or in Australia and then go overseas, that's huge in itself. But to actually take the title out, I mean, you must have been like, I'm not believing it. You know, yeah, it's just yeah. like, oh, my God, is this actually happening? That's how I would feel. Yeah, look, it was very surreal. Um, like I said, so I went over there with, um, I guess, minimal expectations. I, I really just wanted to soak it up and experience it and and make some contacts. It's it's sort of a, a – it's kind of – it's a competition, but it's also a bit of a sort of conference for musicians. So there's they have a lot of events on during the day where the musicians get to meet um, the other musos, and then they also have panels of like um, artists, uh, sorry, industry reps, like um, agents and producers, and and so during the day you've got a lot of opportunities to mix and mingle and meet um, different people in the industry over there. So for me, it was just a chance to go over and and sort of get what I could out of the whole experience. And so to to win it was a, a real surprise. Um, but you know, the the standard over there was amazing. There were people from all over the world. Um, and it was just so much fun to be there and be a part of it. Um, and yeah, it was just really nice to top it off by winning it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And when you were doing the heats, was that all your own music? Yes. Yeah, or... so I decided to definitely just do originals. Um, there's a set of criteria for the competition, um, which is, um, originality, um, blues content. Um, vocals, guitar playing and audience engagement. And so that's the criteria that the judges score against. And they literally just score out of 10 for each of those criteria for each act. And so I just kind of decided that I was going to do only my originals, which I do mostly anyway in my, in my, in my act here. Um, so it wasn't really very much different to what I would normally do, but I decided not to do covers at all. And funnily enough, I was one of the only acts that did that. Every, everyone else that I came across threw in some covers in their set. And so I just kind of thought, well, if that's the criteria, then I'll just I'll just do my own songs. And it's, you know, just a great opportunity to showcase my music overseas. Absolutely, like golden opportunity, yeah. actually, isn't it? And I'm glad that you took advantage of that, that's for sure. And it paid off. 
Yeah, yeah. yeah. Look, I think it, it, you know, and, and telling stories and engaging with the audience is kind of what I really love to do. And so yes. I felt like it was just all a pretty good fit. Um, and so I just kind of did what I would do here. And I, and I you know, picked the songs that kind of tell the stories and, and the characters in my songs and, and, and spoke with the audience about the songs. And, and, and it just seemed to all gel. Um, I felt pretty much from the first heat, um, that there was just a really good energy. And then I was, you know, coming across people through the days and there just seemed to be a really good positive kind of engagement with everybody. And it just seemed to snowball from the Wednesday night through till the Saturday. And, um, yeah, it was, it was, you know, it was, it was pretty out there, you know, like we, I would finish my heat and then, and then they wouldn't announce the winners for that night until about 1 a.m. Oh my goodness. So so you'd finish your heat at about, by about sort of 10.30, 11 o'clock, you were finished and sort of hang around a little bit. And then they had these after parties um, at certain venues where they would then announce who was going through to the next round. And, like, I was just so tired by the end of it. Like, it was so stressful, really, in a lot of ways, preparing for it and the rest of it. So yeah. I just kind of headed back to my hotel and I ended up watching it on, like, a live stream on Facebook to find out that I had gotten through to the final, actually. So it was all a bit surreal. Yeah, right. Did you ever have a moment, and I don't think it for one moment, did you ever have a moment where you went, oh, I think I made a mistake? Um. No, um, there was they, they really kept you on your toes. So each night they had varying set lengths. And ah, so, okay. Yeah, so they wanted you to kind of be on your toes a bit, I think. And so I think Wednesday night was like 30 minutes, Thursday night was 25 minutes, Friday night was like 40 minutes, and then the final was 20 minutes. Uh-huh. And so I remember at one point on the Friday night, which was the longer set, I threw in a couple of different songs um, because the set was longer. And so, and by the time I got to the back, because it's very strictly timed, so they have a person at the front in front of the judges with a stopwatch. And essentially mm-hmm. when you've got, so you've got your t- allocated time, when you've got a minute left, this person puts a sign up saying a minute yeah. and then and then 30 seconds and then 10 seconds. And so I remember getting to the last song and only having about a minute and a half left. And so I did like a really kind of quick version of it. And then the person flashed the sign for 10 seconds and I kind of rounded the song off and finished it. And so that was the only moment where I kind of thought, oh, I got that a little wrong, but it didn't really matter because, I mean, they're original songs, so none of them were any the wiser really because they they could reference it against the song that they knew anyway. So it it didn't really matter, but that was probably the only moment. Um, There were certainly some moments where I thought, you know, geez, some of these guys are really good. Um, So, yeah, I guess it was probably the Wednesday night I felt pretty confident, Thursday night reasonably. Friday was probably the one where I kind of thought it's all getting pretty towards the pointy end of this and – there were some really strong acts in that heat on the Friday night. And I kind of thought, yeah. And, and by then it was only one person was going through from each heat, whereas the first two nights, two people went through from each heat. Right. It's a little bit hairy towards that end of it. But, um, yeah, no, no, I couldn't have asked for a smoother run, really. I, I was very lucky. No technical issues. No gear, no gear failing on me or anything like that. And so, yeah, I couldn't have asked probably for a better run, really. Oh, that's that's really great to hear. And how did you get on with uh, the other musicians from other countries? Yeah, They're very really accepting well. and really yeah. matey. Yeah, it was really good. Um, look, there was certainly some competitiveness with probably some of the other American acts, maybe a little bit more than some of the other international acts, but everybody was just really great. We all got on really well. I think, you know, putting musicians into a competition is – not really natural for us yeah you know what i mean and so all of us would sort of talk after the shows or or even during the days a lot of us caught up for like lunches and things like that and and sort of would laugh about the fact that we were competing with each other yeah Um, because it isn't really in our in our kind of you know dna to be competing we're sort of making art you know what i mean and so exactly um but everybody was really really good there, there was certainly some a couple of acts that were probably a little a little pushy and a little a little serious about it 
but mm. it didn't rub off on anyone. Everyone was really enjoying, I think, just being there, you know what I mean? I mean, for me, it was just a buzz to be in Memphis, you know? Like, oh, God, yeah, yeah. So during the day, we were, I was out and about. I was at the, you know, the, you know, went to the Civil Rights Museum and went and checked out all sorts of cool things, you know? So I was just soaking it up. Yeah, what, an, what a great experience. Yeah. So do you think you'll go back? Uh, because the, the Blues Challenge is held every year, correctly? Yeah. Do, I, do you mean do you think I'll go back and compete or do you think I'd yeah. go back? Yeah, well, both. Um, no, I don't think both. I'd compete in it again. Um, uh, I think the, uh, the, there are some rules around competing again in the same category. So they've got okay. a band category and a solo and duo category. Right. And so I could technically, I guess, go over and compete in the band category, but I don't think I want to. Yeah, right. Um, yeah. I feel as though like going over the first time and nailing it and bringing it home, I think was just like I couldn't really ask for more, you know what I mean? So No, that's right. I'd really that's love right. to go over maybe. I, I don't know if it's – I don't think I'll be able to make it happen next year, but maybe the year after I'd love to go over and actually watch it. Um, yeah, right, right, and, and, and not have that stress, I yeah, guess. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. And, and you know, and they invite sort of previous winners to judge and things like that. So I'd love to maybe be involved in something like that in the future, yeah. Yeah, that'd be great. I think you'd be really good at that, actually. Yeah, cheers. Yeah, yeah. So how did you find it the very first time that you played live, that you performed live? Oh, wow. Um were you nervous or I have some other questions that probably lead before that, yeah. but this is the one that come out now. So yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I mean, I remember the first time I played in public, I was probably, I don't know, in fifth grade in primary school and there was a, um, a talent quest and me and a couple of mates, there was only one of us that knew how to play guitar. Mm-hmm. And, and so he played guitar and a couple of others sang and, and, and we won the talent quest. Oh, wow. And then, and then we would like, the principal was really keen on it. And so they'd get us to sing out the end of the assemblies for a couple of months. You know what I mean? Like in like fifth class or something. And I just remember, I just, I don't know, just really enjoying the buzz of it. I don't ever oh, remember yeah. nerves. <laughs> like even people ask me all the time about nervousness, you know, before shows. I just feel like the more the more exciting or the more whatever, like, you know, the scale of whatever I'm doing just makes me more excited. Yeah, you know what? I have that same feeling. People say to me, how do you get up there and sing in front of all those people? I'm like, I love to do it. Yeah. People there or people not there makes no difference to me one bit. I just want to get up there and perform. Yeah, yeah. Look, I just get a buzz from it. I, I, it's just fun. And so, yeah. yeah, I guess that that memory was just that feeling, I guess, of, of being up in front of people and and doing something that you love doing. So, yeah. Absolutely. So then let's go a little bit further back, shall Mm -hmm. we? Mm -hmm. So who or what was your earliest musical influence or inspiration? Um, Yeah, look, Dad had a lot of old um, rhythm and blues records. And so I guess my earliest memories was him playing records in the house, um, and so it was stuff like Little Richard and Chuck Berry and Elvis Presley and Jerry Lee Lewis and Ray Charles. And then he'd mix that up with things like sort of sort of country and Western stuff like Marty Robbins and Johnny Cash. And so they're my earliest memories. And I guess as you get older, you go find your own music as a teenager or, yeah, you know, and, and it was different. I, I remember sort of finding sort of more rock music and things like that to listen to as a teenager and in my twenties. But then at some point, I felt like that early music just was always there. In yeah. Me. And so when it came time to, like, because I played different music over the years, never really took it very seriously. It was always just a hobby for me. Like, I just liked playing and um, I never really played with any, I mean, I, we had a band in high school and we would do gigs and it was fun. But then when I left school, I don't know, something kind of changed and I, and I just stopped playing music as a live thing. And ah. I remember... And I started just collecting bits of gear. So I started collecting recording gear, tape machines and guitars and effects units and and just really enjoyed recording. And so I did that for probably 10 or more years and never played gigs. 
Oh, um, wow, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, there'd be a party. I'd play, I'd pick up the guitar and play a song or we'd have a get together and someone would want to sing a song, there'd be a piano. So we'd play a bit of, you know, play some songs. And it was never serious. And then it wasn't until the early 2000s that I started getting that kind of, I don't know, that desire to play in front of people again. And so I did a few things, a few different things, mostly rock oriented really. I was, you know, I mean, I was in my twenties in the nineties. So, you know, the grunge thing was pretty big to me, Nirvana and Pearl Jam and Soundgarden and all that sort of stuff. So that was kind of yeah. more where my head was at, to be honest. Right. And then, and then it wasn't until I, I came across an Australian act called CW Stone King. I don't know if you're familiar with, with him. No, um, not no. Yeah. And, and my brother gave me a, a CD of his and that would have been, oh, geez, I'm going to guess around maybe 2006, 2007. And he gave me a CD of this guy. And, and I remember thinking that it sounded like it was recorded, you know, 50 years ago. And it turns out it was recorded. Um, it was a new rec a new record. And so I was just blown away by someone being able to bring out music that sounded so old, but actually have success with it. You know what I mean? And I thought yeah. for me, it was always blues was just this thing that you part you, you played it at a party or you hang in with your friends or whatever. And, and that's the first time really I thought, wow, well, I could probably play these songs and, and take it out and play it live. And so that's when, it, and then it took a couple of years of kind of, I don't know, writing songs that I was happy enough with and, and then, you know, buying some really nice old sort of vintage guitars. And, and yeah, by about 2010 was probably when I started, I went out and started playing blues gigs. Right, right. Yeah, 2010. So there was a big gap in between that. Beg your pardon? There was a big gap in between that where music was just a, a hobby for me, really. Right. So now you've made mention of some guitars. So that makes me feel like you're a little bit of a collector. Yeah. <laughs> and you know what? They always say, teach your kids an instrument because all they'll do is want to purchase instruments and <laughs> and gear and they'll never have time to get into trouble or the money for that matter. Yeah, so, that's right. <laughs> so would you like to tell us about what was your first guitar? Oh, wow. Um, well, the, uh, there was always, there was an acoustic at some I don't know, unknown brand acoustic guitar that used to sit in the lounge room when I was a kid. I think dad maybe had a crack at playing guitar and it never really went into it. So it used to sit around in the lounge room. And I remember as a kid kind of strumming it, but not really coming up with much with it. But then um, the first guitar I bought, real guitar I bought, was a, a, tel a black Telecaster, a US Tele that I bought for my 21st birthday I bought for myself. Nice. Then, I remember having a, maybe a, one of those Yamaha um, electrics, but nothing really serious. And then, yeah, the first guitar, real guitar I bought was a, a 91 Telecaster, black US Telecaster that I bought in 92. Nice, nice. And, and, and what, so is when I saw you, you were playing acoustic. Yeah. So what, a, what brand of acoustic guitar is that? Yeah, so that day I would have had the – so I've got a 1944 Harmony, which is an arch-top jazz guitar. Yeah. Oh, so jealous. Yeah, so that's <laughs> the one I would have had with me at Golden that day and a 1943 Stella, a little parlour guitar. Um, so I used two or three guitars live mostly because I used some different tunings. Yep. So to save – sort of tuning up on stage and changing tunings. I just bring sort of two or three guitars tuned to different um, tunings. Pitches, yeah. So do you play a Cole Clark or a Mason or anything of no, uh, the Australian? No, no, none of those. No, I've got, my heart is sort of more towards older guitars. And, yep. and, and you know, I, I've just bought a, um, a new guitar, but it's modelled to sort of look to look like it's quite old is a, a resonator, a steel bodied resonator, which I just recently bought. But most of my guitars are pretty old, um, sort of 50s, 60s. I've got, yeah, some late 60s Japanese guitars. Um, mm -hmm. And they're yeah. really, really good. The Japanese ones yeah. are really good. Yeah. Now, a, a question because I have my little mini mate here. Yep. So, and I love playing that. But of course, with the weather, 
also changes the guitar somewhat. Yeah. So how do you, does the older guitar or do the older guitars, do they suffer with the weather at all? And for being so old, yeah. um, are they still straight? Do they still play well? Are they yeah. still, um, you know, be able to be worked on quite easily with no dramas? Yeah, yeah. Look, I'm pretty lucky. They're both, they're all in pretty good nick. Um, uh, they don't like the heat. They don't like the cold, but that no. um, probably, it wouldn't matter if it was a new guitar or an old one, I think. Um, so I'm always a little bit mindful of, you know, they don't spend too much time in the car or, you know, things like that. Outdoor gigs can be just a little stressful, I suppose, but I'm, I'm pretty mindful of that. They don't, they sort of stay in their cases until it's time to play and things like that. I think where you can be a little bit more careful with them, but generally yeah. speaking, I mean, honestly, like my harmony and the Stella, they've played, you know, they've played a thousand gigs probably in the last 12, 13 years that I've had them, you know, so they work. They, they, they've got no dramas working um, and they've never let me down, touch wood. Um, yeah. You maintain them a little differently, I suppose, and take a bit of extra care at certain things, like I was saying, like particularly on hot days, I don't like to leave them in the car. Like I won't leave them. No, in. no, it's big, no, no. Yeah, so, you know, just things like that. I don't think there are any really much differences if it was a new guitar or an old guitar. It's just basic sort of common sense, I suppose, they would and they don't like the cold and the heat. Yeah, yeah. So uh, what are they solid top guitars, do you know? Yeah, so the Harmony is a solid top, a carved top actually, um, and the, the Stella... Stella is maybe a solid top. I'm not sure. It's a small scale parlor guitar, yeah. um, a 43 model built during the war. So they both got quite thick necks. They don't have truss rods. There was a shortage of steel during the war. So they, um, they made the necks. The necks are quite thick because um, yeah. there's no truss rods. And so there's little things like that, wooden tail pieces because of the steel shortage and, and things like that. Well, how lucky are you to have come across them and put them in your collection and play them most importantly yeah, because yeah. otherwise, you know, a lot of those older guitars fall by the wayside and end up getting thrown out, which is really unfortunate. No yeah. musical instrument should ever be tossed. No, and I think also, like I've thought about over the years just retiring them and but I just think, you know what, that's what they're made for. They, they, they you know, they're, they're made to be played, so... I love playing them. I mean, at, at some point I thought that they were deteriorating to, a, you know, more than, than than would, you know, be reasonable. Then I'd probably retire them. But until then, I'm, I just love playing them. Yeah. And another question on the, the older guitars, mm. um, do you find that the sound of them has changed over the years because a common uh, common thing with guitars or wooden guitars, you know, and I'm talking probably specifically about the Maiden because that's what I have, mm. is solid top, but the more you play it and the older it is, the more that the sound opens up and becomes more yeah. beautiful. Have you found that with your um, uh, probably, Harmony and Stella? Probably not because I guess by the time I bought them, they were already sort of 60 Seasoned, five, five yes. So, yep, yep, but, yep. I do, but I do agree with that whole notion, I suppose, of the wood and the, the, the ageing and the opening up of the sound. I, I definitely think if you, you know, if you bought two guitars and put one in a case and put the, and the other one was played for 50 years, I, I think they would sound different, definitely. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, something about, I guess, the way the wood settles and, and the vibrations of, the, of playing them um, that certainly does that. But they're both just, just gorgeous sounding instruments. And, and like, I feel like when I bought them, you know, they were already, just beautiful sounding instruments and yeah. yeah just a question i've actually never asked anybody yes yet is what strings do you use um so i use sort of uh 11 to 50 odd i guess flat wound electric guitar strings on all my guitars acoustic or electric oh really yeah yeah ah. flat wound strings is something that i've sort of moved across to over the years um uh, they particularly, I particularly like them with slide. I feel like that, that, right. that, that resistance between. I use brass slides, 
And so that sound between the brass slide and the grooves in, in wound strings is something I don't particularly like. No. Um, and flat wound strings just have a much smoother contact between the brass slide and the string. So I use, yeah, sort of 11 to 52s um, flat wound strings. Wow, that's really interesting. And you mentioned before that you've not long got a resonator. Mm. Now, I am a huge fan of resonators and slide guitar. Yeah. Do you remember the first time that you thought, I'm going to have a go at playing slide? Yeah, it's funny actually because I remember being much younger and buying a slide but not knowing about open tuning. Mm -hmm. and trying to play slide in standard tuning. And I just remember thinking, I remember at the time just kind of going, this is this is hard. Like how does anyone get that sound or that that sort of that style of blues on a, on a guitar? I didn't, I hadn't really fathomed the concept of open tuning. And so I remember that slide went back into a box or a case and it probably was five or ten years later that I kind of discovered the whole concept of open tuning Mm -hmm. and realise that that's, I mean, people do use slides in standard, but it's a very different kind of application than, than the, most of the blues stuff. Yeah. And so, yeah, yeah I remember then realising, oh, okay, there's this thing called open tuning and then rediscovering the slide and kind of taking it from there and teaching myself then. Oh, you taught yourself slide. Yeah, I taught myself sort of everything really. Oh, really? Oh, because that was my next question. Did you have lessons when you were young or...? No, no. I, the friend of mine that I mentioned in primary school that was the only one that knew how to play guitar, mm -hmm. I remember he wrote some chords for me when we were in high school and um, and then another friend of mine gave me a chord book and that's it. No, I'd never had any lessons, no. Oh, well, Frank, you've just won a major competition. You've never had a lesson. I think that's fabulous. <laughs> that That's really a feather in your cap. I, I don't know. I feel I'm like, very impressed. I feel like, um, I don't know, like sometimes I think there's a originality in maybe discovering things in that way and teaching them to yourself. And I remember I being agree, yeah. with, you know, the likes of Keith Richards and the rest of it and, when they were teenagers or whatever, they'd put a record on and they'd just play along with it until they worked it out. And that's kind of more or less what I did. I'd just put music on and go, okay, well, that sounds like that. And I'd search over the neck until I found the note that matched and then sort of put two and two together of where everything sits and learnt things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's great. I, I really admire people who can do mm -hmm. that. That's fantastic. Now, we've talked about your acoustic guitars and... Uh, your your resonator. Mm. Uh, what brand is the resonator? It's a Dobro, is it? No, it's actually a. You know what? It's not an amazingly expensive brand. I think they're called. It's actually called Bourbon Street, and it's, so they're a Chinese made, but they're actually really really good. Um, it's a tricone resonator. I've had a couple of different ones over the years. I've got another wooden one that's a national, yep. a wooden bodied one. That one's in pieces because I've came up with the kind of idea of um, uh, modifying it and then so, <laughs> and, and that project got put aside about three years ago yeah. and it's still in pieces. Um, but I've got a, a really nice wooden-bodied national resonator as well, which one day I'll put back together. But this one I came across maybe five, four, four months ago mm -hmm. and uh, I was playing out in Orange and the guy that got us out there for the gig actually is a guitar player and he showed it to me, he said he bought it a few months earlier and and he wasn't really getting his head around playing it and so I bought it off him. But it's really quite lovely and it's aged, made to look like it's kind of 50 years old and it's aged beautifully and, and tarnished and, and, and sort of, uh, yeah, made to look like it's older. But, yeah, it's, it's the brand is called Bourbon Street and it's been a really cool guitar actually. Yeah, I have seen those Bourbon Street yeah, ones. Yeah, yeah. So I was I was looking around for a resonator and I'm like, okay, what about this one? What about this one? And none have really grabbed me yet, but I did take special notice of the Bourbon Street ones. Yeah. So, yeah. I guess, I don't know, look, everyone's got different opinions, I suppose, on stuff like this. Probably 10, 15 years ago, maybe some of the Chinese stuff wasn't of the same quality but i really do think it's the, the playing leveled and and i'm also not really a, a 
I'm not really like a snob when it comes to stuff like that. I like a guitar that just if it fits and I and it, and it feels good, then I'm happy to kind of give it a go. And and also like guitars maybe that make you work a little. Um, other than the Telecaster, like I said, that I bought many many years ago, a lot of my other guitars aren't really that sort of high end Fender and Gibson sort of thing. I'm more of a fan. Like I said, I've got a couple of really nice Japanese electrics sort of late 60s early 70s japanese electrics which i really love playing and to a lot of people they've got a bit of a cult following and and some people really like that a lot of people kind of snob them off as well so i just feel like it's just individually a guitar if a guitar fits and and it gives me a good feeling then i'm happy to kind of give it a go you know yeah definitely so do you play acoustic more or electric more i think you probably play acoustic more it depends on the gig, uh, if it's a band gig or a solo gig. The the harmony technically is an acoustic guitar, I guess, but it's got it's got a, a really cool um, humbucker pickup in it. So it I play that. That's the guitar that gets played the most. Like that, whether it's an acoustic gig or a band gig, and that's an acoustic guitar. But I normally try to mix it up with some solid body electrics and I've got a yeah a couple of nice hollow body electrics as well so it just depends I've got a, quite a few so I tend to kind of a few weeks out from a run of shows I'll kind of restring a few of them and have a bit of a play and and then I feel like okay maybe I'll take these guys on the road for this run you know yeah yeah oh, that's good mm. and what genre do you say you like playing the blues the best? You mentioned earlier that you have played some rock, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so what is your favourite? Blues is your favourite, I would say. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. It's the, it's, I guess it's the genre that I felt just the most connected to, singing-wise probably more than anything else. Um, yeah. And especially when I first heard Sun House and... Oh. and And they were the guys that really I just kind of went, well, okay, like I... I connect with this and um, and I remember, you know, being a young kid, I remember my dad would, you know, he'd put records on and he'd be like, he'd put a Ray Charles record on and he'd be like, this guy is the greatest singer that ever lived, you know, and, <laughs> and he would say that about Ray Charles. And so I remember listening to Ray Charles as a kid and just hearing the the pain and the the the, the emotion in his singing and, and I guess I just resonate with, with blues and soul music, you know. Absolutely, absolutely. So the first song you ever wrote, was that a blues tune? <laughs> no, no. It, no? Would have been, it would have been a terrible song. I remember, you know, I would have been in high school, I guess, the first time I tried to write a song. Um, and I remember a group of us wrote a song for the Year 12 Farewell. So that was probably the first thing I remember actually kind of writing a song that actually was finished. And then... And then I went through a phase of just writing music rather than writing songs and writing a lot more instrumental stuff. And, and yeah, yeah. But I'm sure it was probably quite terrible. But uh, I find with when I, blues just kind of resonated with me in a, in a lot of ways, even with the songwriting. Um, that's when I first felt really that I fitted with yep. writing. Yeah. I, I, I'm totally hearing you there. Totally hearing you there, that's for sure. So you mentioned before that you were singing from quite young. Mm. So were you always a singer at home or it was just when you guys got together at school? Yeah, no, there was always singing at home. Like like I said, like Dad, when like Mum had a transistor radio in the kitchen that was just on all the time. And I remember, you know, I grew up in Sydney, so it was Western Sydney and it was always 2WS on yep. the radio so it was always that, that kind of you know they were they've always been i guess into the 50s and 60s rock and roll rhythm and blues soul music and and then hearing as a young kid hearing things like elton john and billy joel and songs like that and that really kind of just i remember they would just jump out of the radio these songs you know they were just such they just I don't know, like you connected with them as a kid, you know what I mean? And then and then Dad would, you know, come home and put a record on and it would be, you know, like I said, Johnny Cash or or, or Chuck Berry or Little Richard or and so yeah, I, I felt like I probably should have been a drummer because I would always be tapping on things actually more than singing. Oh. So I, I remember my I would get on my dad's nerves or my mum's nerves because everything <laughs> I'd be tapping and and things like that. And even at school I remember I you know, I'd be walking down the stairs at school or something and tapping the railing, 
and mm-hmm. hearing the different ways that it resonated. And so I probably should have been a drummer, really. But um, but yeah, always singing in the house. Yeah. Yeah. So that kind of leads me to the next question I have for you. Mm-hmm. Do you play any other instruments besides guitar? I play a little bit of everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yes, I, I play piano and keys. I play bass. I can play a bit of drums. Like over the years, I've recorded tracks where I've played all the instruments on it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I wouldn't say I'm a great drummer, um, but you know enough to kind of knock out a song. But I think because I've just always been so curious with music that, and I remember in high school that we had the music room had all the gear set up all the time, and so you'd walk into the class, and if nobody was there yet, and the drum kit was there, well, you'd just jump behind the drum kit and start making noise. So. Yeah, I'll play a little bit of everything. That's fantastic to be versatile and to be able to use it on your own songs as well. That's a mm. that's a great achievement as well. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about, we know you have a solo career, but tell us a little bit about your band. Yeah, so from around 2012, I put a band, my first sort of blues band together. It was the Sinister Kids. So it was Frank Sultan and the Sinister Kids. And we played probably through till about 2018 as the same, pretty much the same lineup, a couple of backing singers that kind of came and and went. Um, and then in 2018, I made the decision to sort of quit my real work and sort of focus on music full time. And the only way I could sort of, um, make that work financially was to kind of become a solo act. And so yeah, around right. 2018, I kind of dropped the band vibe and just started touring solo. And then probably a year later, I, I jammed. I was going to a thing called the Echuca Blues Festival in Victoria and I got a phone call from a bass player in Melbourne um, who does a, like a jam, a jam night in Melbourne every Wednesday night. And... Um, and he was bringing that to the Chuka Blues Festival and he asked me if I wanted to sit in and do a 20-minute set with him. And I'd never done that before, just kind of rocking up to somewhere where I'd not met the guys and playing music with them. So it was a little bit nerve-wracking, but I said yes. And so that then got me on the path of just jamming with different players. And so from 2018 onwards till like, you know, last year, that's what I did a lot of. And so I ended up with a really great network of players sort of from Brisbane to, to Melbourne, really of drummers and bass players. And so that became my norm through 19 and 20 and 21 and 22, where I would just take the gig and then I'd contact a drummer that I knew in the area and a bass player and and we'd just kind of rock in and, and I'd just count us in and we'd just go for it. And so that really helped me become, I think much, a much better player and more mm-hmm. confident, I think, with the idea of just kind of walking in and just playing a set with people that you'd never met before. And so, I mean, I think one year, one year, I think I played with about 40 odd different players wow. through the year. And so that really helped me a lot, I think, in just becoming more confident and versatile. And and then the beginning of this year, when everything happened in Memphis, uh, I kind of came back from Memphis and I sort of decided that I wanted to try and have a bit more of a, of a stable lineup. Yeah. And, and there were some cool local players, like I lived down on the south coast of New South Wales, and there were some cool players that lived locally, and I thought it's probably as good a time as any to kind of get a bit more of a solid lineup. So I've been playing with the same drummer for the last, well, all of this year, mm-hmm. uh, Dr. Adrian Herbert, and... And a, a wonderful harmonica player who lives in Kayama as well, uh, called Dan Sullivan. And so we've we've sort of been they've been stable this year with me, and uh, and a couple of different bass players. Um, so that's still kind of a bit of a revolving door. But um, yeah, I, I feel like there's a there's a real excitement in playing with different players. Everybody brings something different to the to the table, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. But but then there's also the stability of having the same drummer. And then you know the same lead instrument in in Dan on on harp, and so they've really gotten to know the the grooves and and the arrangements of the songs, and so 
we can sort of hold it together because we all know where we're going. I mean, yeah. it made me, jamming with different people forced me to kind of sit more with the songs that had more, I guess, simpler arrangements yeah. rather than the more uh, songs that have more um, intricate arrangements. And so now having the solid lineup means I can sort of expand a little bit with some of that. Well, I think that's very exciting. So let's talk a little bit about your songwriting and your albums that you've done. Would you like to tell the listeners what was your first album? Yep. How that come about and how many albums since then and what's the next one? Yeah, yeah. So the first record was in... We recorded it actually in the week between Christmas and New Year's in 2010. And I I would, had been jamming with a couple of mates of mine in Sydney and and I'd been writing some new songs, the first sort of attempt at writing blues songs. And and then I brought these songs to them and they were like, you know, look, we should we should work on these songs. And so we we sort of spent maybe three or four months just really working the songs and then we recorded them around Christmas of 2010 and put it out in early 2011. That was called uh, Blues from the Lost Motel. Mm -hmm. So first album. And since then, I sort of brought out about 10 albums and about three or four EPs. So sort of roughly an album a year, I suppose, for the last 12, 13 years. Wow, that's fantastic. So all up, how many songs would you say that is? Oh, geez, I think I counted. It's a fair like, few. Probably about 90 songs. That's a really great effort, fantastic effort. Yeah, and, and I'm sure that there's more songs within you as well. I don't see you stopping anytime soon. No, look, I just love doing it, I suppose, you know. And and, and this year when I was in Memphis, um, a couple of days after the, the Blues Challenge win, I went and did a session at Sun Studios in Memphis. Oh, so jealous. <laughs> so, you know, and so I did four hours at Sun on my own and – and managed to knock out. So I thought, well, I could take new songs and then I thought that was a bit risky in, in that, you know, I had a four-hour session booked. I thought, you know what, I'm just going to do, I'm going to pick a song or two off every album and just make it a bit of a collection of my favourite songs that I'd put out over the, you know, the last 10 or 12 years. And so it meant that I was able to knock out 12 songs in four hours. Oh, wow. Just the mere fact of being at that studio. Yeah. Did you, how did you feel like? It was awesome, yeah. It was great. Yeah. I, I mean, I the, if the those. Album, I called if, the album The Ghosts of Sun because that's genuinely uh, how I felt. I remember standing in the studio in the main room and, and you know, there's big photos of Elvis and Johnny Cash and Jerry Lee Lewis on the wall and they're kind of watching you and they, you know, there's a mark, there's an X on the floor where Elvis stood and, and that's where I stood and recorded and, you know, you're singing into the mics that have been there for, you know, 60, 70 years. And, um, oh, wow. And it was pretty special, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's what I was going to say to you, that being in a place that's so iconic and had so many, you know, stellar musicians go through it, that there would have to be some leftover energy there. There would have to be them that's still there. Yeah, so. I felt it. I really felt it. I remember moments where, and you know, you've got your headphones on, and if I finish a take, and then I'd wait for the engineer who's in the control room to kind of let me know that that was a clean take. And I remember the silence with the headphones on. I remember looking across the room, and I thought, inside my own head right now, this is how they would have felt. You know, Jerry Lee and Johnny and and Elvis and the rest of them. And I'd remember that moment and I just, I thought, this is, this is where I am. Like it was surreal, you know, like, and I remember thinking this is how it would have felt for them to yeah. step in the spot and look at that microphone and look around that room and there they are on the walls looking down at me and it was just a really great, great moment. I remember just feeling really positive and full of really good, good mojo and good energy, you know. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. How, what an awesome thing to do. I hope I plan to be going there to have a look at Sun Records too mm -hmm. sometime in the future. So really then I'll be standing there thinking, Frank Sultana stood here. <laughs>
Yeah, look, it's a must see. I think if you're a fan of that era. Oh and, yeah. Mm. Like you know, I remember going. So I spoke to the engineer and a couple of days prior, because I'd booked it months. Once I knew I was going to Memphis in July, I think it was probably August that I rang them and I booked it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when I was there, I rang him a couple of days before the session just to make sure we were all cool to go. And and he was like, I said, look, have you got any advice? And he was like, look, honestly, he goes, come and see it as a punter first and then come here. Don't come here for the first time to do your session because it might all just be a bit overwhelming for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. so it was the best advice because I think it was the Friday day. Yeah, the Friday. So it was the the day before the last heat, before the final. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to go. And so I went and I walked through it as a punter and they, they do a tour through the whole thing because they've turned the whole building into essentially into a museum. Wow. And so all the gear that they've used over the years and um, different um, different uh, bits of equipment over the years, they've got it in sort of glass cabinets upstairs and you walk through. It takes about probably half an hour, 40 minutes, and the guy walks you through. And then the very last part of the tour, you come down a set of stairs, through a door, and then you're in the the, the room, the recording room, which is the original room. room. Yeah, yeah. Um, and... And I'm glad I did that because then by the Monday night when I went in to do the session, it still was obviously awesome because it was where I was, but I did feel like it wasn't as um, intimidating. Yeah, yes, that's the word, isn't it, intimidating, yeah. 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 Now, speaking of recording and everything, uh, you would have sent me some uh, MP3, some tracks of some of your music. Mm -hmm. Uh, Can you think of off the top of your head what they might be yeah so i've thought about you know what songs to to talk about and play um one of my i'm really pleased with all the songs on the new record um but in particular i really like a song called hella high water Mm -hmm. uh, which i wrote um back in the early the early part of 2020 so um i'd just done a run down to tasmania and i had a whole years worth of shows booked i'd i'd never gone in so hard with bookings and i had like 130 shows booked wow good on you and then and then of course everything happened with covid and so i Ugh. remember i got back from tassie in um in f- the first couple of days of february and then i had a couple of shows i think i did a sydney show at the vanguard and i did the stag and hunter in newcastle on the 12th or the 13th or something like that. And then the very next day, everything just, you know, the bottom fell out of everything, right? And we yeah. were locked down and the rest of it. And I remember feeling pretty down and and I literally was talking with agents and talking with venues and everything was just a mess for that week, just working out what we were going to do. And I essentially just kind of postponed or cancelled most of those shows and was yeah. feeling pretty, pretty down, you know. I mean, you know, in retrospect, everybody was probably feeling something like oh, that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that yeah, yeah. Mix, right? So whatever work you do, it affected it, right? So, but I remember just feeling really down and there was probably a week or two where I just didn't know what I was going to do. And and then I came up with the thought of just using it as a time to write and record. And, and so I set myself a channel. I bought a new recording system. I bought a new program and a new computer and I thought well this is as good a time as any to teach myself how to use it Absolutely. And, and then I thought oh I could write I'll try and write a song every week and so I set myself that challenge to write a, a new song every week and record it and then do a video for it and put it out on Facebook every week and so yeah. on Saturday morning I'd start writing and by the following Friday I'd put it on Facebook and I did that for 12 weeks and I wrote yeah. 12 songs in 12 weeks and this was one of them. Oh, that's fantastic. So this track is called Hell or High Water.
Okay, Frank, was that, uh, did you play all of the instruments on that track? Uh, yes, uh, everything bar the harmonica. So we were, um, <laughs> I did this on a couple of the songs on that record uh, where I uh, would send the track to my friend because we weren't allowed to be in contact with each other. Of course, so I yeah. sent the tracks to, I sent that track to Dan Sullivan in Coyama and, and he played it at his place and put a track down and then emailed it back to me and then I mixed it on there. But, yeah, I played everything on it other than that. But the well, one... The version, the version, I guess that uh, I would, I guess we'd be listening to would be the one from the Sun Studios, which is exactly the same. It's me playing everything and and Dan playing the harp. Once I got back from Memphis, I spent about a week with Dan and he put all the harp parts down on the album. But yeah, yeah, that's great. I'm glad that you've chosen one from Sun Studios. And do you have another one from Sun Studios for us to listen to? Yeah, the opening track of the Sun Records album is a song called "The Howling Dogs." which is a song that was on my very first album back in 2011, um, but in a, a different sort of uh, vibe. So I recorded it back in 2011 and it was a little bit of a chunky kind of heavier feel. And then in 2015, we did a live album live at the Vanguard and we did like a sort of steam train beat, quite a fast version of it. And then, right, yep. and so over the years, it's one of those songs that's kind of had two or three three or four incarnations. And so when I, before going over to Memphis, I had started playing that song as a very quiet, kind of slow gospel influenced sort of song. Mm -hmm. And so it's had a couple of different incarnations over the years. And I think this is my favorite way that I've recorded the song. And so when it came to going to Memphis, I kind of thought that'd be a great song to open the album with. Perfect. And what is that song called? It's called The Howling Dogs. The Howling Dogs, and I think we will listen to it now. All right, Frank. Let me know when you're ready. We'll roll on it. I'm ready, man. All right. You roll it. Howling, howling dogs. 
Well, Frank, I have to say, I think that your writing is just fabulous. Love your tracks, love your music, and I want to see more from you. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, you've got a great career going there and you've worked extremely hard for it. Now, have you got a funny story for me? A funny story? Yeah, from any gig that you've been to or... Oh, wow. Um, wow. Um, or an interesting story. <laughs> wow. I, um, let me think. Jeez, put me on the spot there. Um, <laughs> um, I remember... Um, Oh, jeez. There's so many moments, I suppose. Um, oh, my gosh, you put me on the spot. I remember doing a gig in um, in Brisbane back in, like, probably it would have been 2015, I think. We did we did a gig in Sydney opening for Gary Clark Jr. And he was a Texan guitar player who was on tour at the time. And then we got up early and flew to Brisbane. And it was... Um, it was like one of the hottest days on record. It was like it's just the week of Australia Day in 2000, and I'm going to say 2015. Um, and we got to Brisbane and it was easily like 40, 40 plus degrees. Oh. And we were playing at a pub called The Joint in Brisbane. And it was a little mini festival. It was the owner's birthday. And so she put on a little mini festival for her birthday every year called The Little Day Inn. And um, and it was just sweltering inside the pub. There was like 100, 150 people in the pub. Oh, my God. Hands on. And, and people started like passing out and the rest. It was just so hot. Yeah. And so, and, um, and so we, Aracom was upstairs and they had, you know, and I was kind of running upstairs every sort of 20 minutes and having a cold shower and then coming back downstairs. And I did that for like three or four hours during the day because otherwise I was just going to pass out. Yep. And so then we got to playing and within a song or two and I looked across at my bass player and he took his shirt off. I was like, okay. <laughs> and, so then, and then another song in, I looked back at my drummer and he's taking his shirt. I'm like, okay. And then someone in the front in the audience took his shirt off and took his pants off <laughs> and, and his underwear. And so my bass player saw that and he was, you know, probably you know, half a dozen or more beers in by then. So he took his pants off. And within two or three songs, all of us were essentially playing in our underwear. <laughs> um, in like 40 degree heat in this packed pub in Brisbane. So that that's probably the one that comes to mind first, but yeah. yeah. I love that. That is such a fantastic <laughs> story. <laughs> Have you ever been to a venue where you they say, oh, here's the area where you're playing and you just look at it and go, not today? <laughs> um, you know, we've all had those, I guess. Yes. You know, playing on the back of trucks or playing on a, you know, in the corner. I guess the only one that bothers me and I don't, thankfully I guess I've worked through playing those venues now and I don't have to play them anymore but you know when they stick you in front of the TVs in a you know in a, in a club or something and yeah that always used to really annoy me you know and I'd always end up sort of you know insisting that they turn the football off or whatever it is off before I'd play in front of them but they, that used to probably bother me more than some of the shonky stages I've played on but yeah <laughs> I mean, some of them you think, oh, my God, is this actually going to, like, not collapse under me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, there are a few few funny ones, you know, where you stomp your feet and you're kind of wondering whether you're going to fall through, yeah. Yes. <laughs> As you can tell, I've been there, done that. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. So what is the best live act or show you've ever seen, Australian or otherwise? Oh, that's a huge question. Um well, you know what? Uh, I reckon I'm going to say probably one of the best moments I can remember at a concert was seeing Joe Cocker in the early 90s in Sydney at the State Theatre. And it was sort of, I guess, not the tail end of his career, but I guess, you know, sort of, I guess the back end of his career. And, and he was struggling a little bit with his voice that night. And I remember he started... Um, I get by with a little help from my friends and there's obviously that iconic start and the organ and then he's meant to start singing the song with the organ in the background and and he went to sing the song 
he went to sing the line and he faltered and he stopped. Oh. And the organ player kind of kept playing it and and then someone in the audience kind of yelled out, you can do it, Joe. And then other people started doing it. And, and I get shivers thinking about it. And we all just started, you know, encouraging him. And and he kind of took a step back. Someone brought out a cup of something for him. I don't know what it was, tea or something. <laughs> and he walked up to the microphone and he nailed it. And oh, I remember man. feeling like genuinely and everybody was just, in a, just huge applause and I remember just feeling that we that the audience got him over the line a little bit yeah. like that encouragement and that support and so I think that was probably one of the most in, I don't know just touching moments at a gig but I've been lucky enough to see so many great gigs Billy Thorpe in the early 90s was something to behold um, but yeah you know lots of great gigs but I think that Joe Cocker moment is probably probably one of the most yeah, touching moments I think I've ever had at a concert. Yeah, that's really touched me hearing the story. It really has. That's, um, you know, the epitome of support, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It really is. So, Frank, where are you playing in the next few months? Uh, you've been touring, so... Yeah, well, we just got back from the States. I just did a couple of festivals in the US and, and we've launched the album in July and we've done, you know, lots of shows, Melbourne... Uh, New South Wales, Queensland. We just got back from a run in Adelaide um, and a festival in Queensland. And, yeah, I did Colorado and Las Vegas in the States. And so October is actually the first – this is the first time I've had a chance to actually sort of not book some gigs and have a little bit of a break. So we're doing, I think, called the Wingham Blues – uh, Wingham Music Festival up on the mid north coast in not this weekend next weekend and mm. then the Dave and Hunter in Newcastle and then a couple of weeks off and then I'm off to um, doing a show in Wollongong and on the mid north coast and then off to Western Australia to do sort of ten days over there playing some solo playing a solo run over there and and then yeah kind of sort of wrap things up sort of early December, we're doing a couple of things and then have a little bit of a break and then I'll be back over to the States in January, February to do a thing called the Legendary Blues Cruise. Wow. Um, which is going to be a lot of fun. That's out of Miami. Um, yeah, so a lot going on. Uh, you know, a new record hopefully out maybe by March or April next year and, and just keep doing it. Yeah, look, I... Really wish you all the success. You've already done so much for the industry and for the blues genre. And I want to see you continue to uh, do that even more and promote the scene even more. And um, you will have given me some links so to all of your socials and et cetera and to your music maybe on Spotify or some of those. Yeah, we've well, done a lot actually now, which has been really good. I've kind of... It's been a struggle dealing with the whole Spotify thing. I, you know, the, the, the revenue is just so low. Bad, yeah. And, um, and so I've got a couple of songs on Spotify, but we've really turned all well, everything I've got now is out on a, a, on a platform called Bandcamp, which pays the artists really quite well and it's still affordable for the punters. Um, so, yeah, yeah. Bandcamp. Well, so we will put all of those links in right. the description of this interview. And I really look forward to catching up with you sometime next year, Frank, when you're back from your travels and have some more stories to tell us. Yeah, cheers. Great. Thank you so much, Frank. I'll say good night to you. Thanks, Crystal. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Good night. Good night. And we were joined this evening by the wonderful Frank Sultana. Thank you so much for joining me this evening, listeners. I hope you'll stay with me and join me next week when I have another fabulous guest for you. Until then, please stay safe, stay happy, stay cool and stay awesome. But please, most of all, Stay tuned to this channel. Good evening. Mm -hmm.